You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Pastoral Medicine. This is Lecture 9. Dear friends, you have seen how necessary it is to relate a state of illness in a human being to his spiritual life and experience. The understanding that should be brought to illness by the two groups of people who have especially to do with pastoral medicine can really only come from such a point of view. Today, therefore, I would like once more to consider the actual state of being ill in connection with a person's spiritual life, this time from a standpoint that I think will throw greatest light upon the nature of illness. As human beings, we alternate between waking and sleeping. You all know in general what can be said out of our world conception about these two conditions. Today let us hold clearly in our minds what really happens in the human being during sleep. During sleep the physical body and etheric body are by themselves. The astral body and ego are also by themselves. Turning first to the physical and etheric bodies, we know that by virtue of what these bodies are, certain processes go on in them that during the person's sleep are independent of the activity of his astral body and ego. In the human organism we find processes going on that, first of all, in the way they must play themselves out, are not at all suited to this physical organism. In the physical body we have to do with physical processes. Now, physical processes take their course outside in the mineral kingdom. They are not suited to the mineral kingdom. Excuse me, they are suited to the mineral kingdom. They are not at all suited to the constitution of the human physical body. And yet this human physical body is, so to say, subject through all the time of sleep to these physical processes in the same way that the mineral kingdom is subject to them. We must be aware of this contradiction in the human being precisely during sleep. During sleep he ought to be a world of physically active forces and substances, but that is something he really cannot be. That is the reason why processes that go on in his physical body during sleep, unless they are brought into balance, cause illness. The general assertion that sleep is healthful is, of course, correct in a certain sense. But it is only correct under certain conditions. And it must not prevent us from examining, without prejudice, what the true situation is. Physical processes in the human physical body can only be healthful for the human being when his ego and astral organization are draw are down in his physical body. And this is the normal condition during waking life. It is constantly interrupted by the sleep condition. Normally, however, even during sleep, the catabolic process is still always going on in physical man. It must be there so that man's soul life and spiritual life as a whole can really unfold. For, the, for his spiritual life is not connected with anabolic processes, only with the catabolic processes. During sleep, therefore, there must be just the quantity of catabolic processes that a human being needs for his waking life to unfold the next morning. If too many catabolic processes are there because of some unhealthy sleep condition, then there is a residue of catabolic processes piling up in the human organism, and then we have the inner cause for an illness. If now we extend our investigation to the etheric body, we find that during sleep only such processes can take place in the etheric body as otherwise take place in the plant kingdom. 
During day consciousness, when the astral body and ego are in the etheric, bo- in the etheric body, these processes are always raised to a higher level. But from the moment of a person's going to sleep to the moment of waking, they take their course in the same way that they do in the plant kingdom. Thus they too are not suited to the human organism. They need to be balanced by the astral body and ego. If they create a residue, then there too is cause for illness. So, we can say, sleep can show us how causes of illness really originate in the human organism, for they are fundamentally the normal sleep processes. At the same time, they are the basis for man's soul-spiritual life. And that points to a secret of this world, that whenever one penetrates to reality, one finds that it has two sides. On one side, in the sleep condition of man's physical and etheric bodies, we find the basis for his spiritual development. On the other side, in the very same processes, we find the basis for his illnesses, Thereby, illness is brought into direct connection with human spiritual development. And we can say, if we study what is active during sleep in the human physical and etheric bodies, we find the fundamental causes of illness. Now let us consider from this point of view the human being who during waking life does not go down deeply enough into his physical and etheric bodies which is what we have found to be the case in the mentally retarded or psychopath. With such a person, the soul and spirit enter into processes of illness and live with them. Special value should be laid on this knowledge that psychopaths and the so-called mentally disturbed are always closely involved in their inner life with causes of illness. You see, one has to look at such things carefully. But now let us go to the outer world. Let us start from the human physical body, plate 6, left, and consider the outer mineral world that relates to it. During sleep we have processes in the human physical body from which the ego is missing. They go on without really any inner working quote-unquote motor. But there is ego out there in the world in all those mineral processes. In them is what we can call world ego. So we have on the one hand, within the processes of the human physical body, a condition of non-ego, a sum of processes that are egoless, processes that lack ego. We have, on the other hand, in our outer environment, a sum of mineral processes and mineral substances that are permeated by ego. That means by all the hierarchies who are to be identified with ego. Mineral substance has ego. Therefore, let us assume that we observe in some person's physical body a process that should not be there, a sick process. It lacks ego. What can we do if we want to cure this condition? We can search outside in the mineral kingdom for that part of the ego that the person lacks to cure what is too much asleep in him, to cure what is still continuing to sleep in him during his waking life. Then we have the right remedy for him. If you give him the substance that has an affinity to his sick organ, the ego force which his organ lacked is brought into the organ. This is the principle underlying our search in inorganic nature around us for medicinal remedies for the physical body of the sick person. We have to find the corresponding substance that has ego force. Then it has an healing effect. Thus the transition from pathology to therapy rests upon a correct insight into the relation between the processes of the human physical body and the outer mineral world on the one hand, and the relation of the human etheric body to the plant world on the other hand. There you have the gist of the matter. 
if we observe too exuberant a growth in the etheric body, we realize that the etheric body is lacking proper penetration by the astral body. Then we must search in the plant kingdom for the proper corresponding remedy. This is the direction our work must take. You can see that one must recognize the spirit in nature, the spirit that is in the mineral and plant kingdoms of the world. It is the spirit, not the substance, that one must know, because in reality one heals the human being through the spirit that is in the mineral and in the plant. The nature of substance is this, that it is not truly governed by spirit, but even so it has the spirit in it. And whoever wants to heal, without recognizing the spirit in stones and plants, can only grope his way through traditional theory. He can try one thing or another and see whether it helps, but he will never know why it helps, because he will never know just where the spirit is in possession of some mineral or how it is in possession of it. To be a healer requires first and foremost a spiritual outlook on the world, And indeed the greatest anomaly of our time is this, that it is medicine itself that has the frightful disease, materialism. Medicine is seriously ill with materialism. It has become blind and is falling asleep, and this is creating harmful soul substances in science. It really needs to be healed. One can indeed say the sickest man of our time is not the Turk, as was the case in the nineteenth century for European humanity. The sickest man of our time is the medical doctor. Footnote, quote, the sickest man, close quote. This refers to a European expression, quote, the sick man on the Bosporus, close quote, end of footnote. This is a fact that physicians should know. Also, at most, the theologians for then perhaps the secret will remain among those to whom it has been entrusted. Let us look at these things more closely. There are certain persons who are not psychopathic or insane in the sense in which one is justified in using those terms, but who nevertheless illustrate what I have been talking about during the last few days. They descend into their physical and etheric bodies in such a way that they acquire a certain perceptible connection to their sick condition, to sick processes. These are the somnambulists, whose peculiar state is not make-believe. It has often been described to the general public, and every initiate knows it well. While they are in their somnambulistic condition, they describe their illnesses. They go down into their physical and etheric body, Now, the ordinary, normal human being in waking life has his ego and astral body connected with his physical and etheric bodies to a degree that is in quality, if we use a rather pedantic scientific terminology, a completely saturated connection. In the case of these sick individuals, we can say, the ego and astral body do not combine with the etheric and physical body in accordance, to speak figuratively, with their exact atomic weight. Some of the ego and astral body is left out. It has not entirely sunk down. But then it is this element that is able to perceive. Only that part of the ego and astral body perceives that has not sunk down into the etheric and physical body. If some of the astral body and ego is superfluous in such a person, then he has this inner perception and he can describe his illness. But now there is another condition, which I have already described to you, a condition of the opposite kind, in which the normal sleep condition is disturbed. In this case, when the ego and astral body are outside the physical and etheric body, and things happen in the ego and astral body that do not belong in this soul-spiritual entity, parenthesis, as the things I was just describing did not belong in that physical etheric body, close parenthesis, when too much spirit is experienced by the ego and astral body during sleep, parenthesis, as too much nature was experienced in the opposite condition by the physical etheric body, close parenthesis, 
then a clairvoyance comes about that borders on a pathological state. The individual carries into sleep a certain power to perceive spiritual things. Then afterward he carries back into waking consciousness memories of his spiritual perceptions. In particular, these spiritual perceptions that are present abnormally between his going to sleep and waking appear in lively dreams. And then we observe what every initiate knows well, that the dreams, if they are regarded properly, have the following content. Suppose that the sick person, the physically sick person, is in the former condition I was describing. He dips down with his spirit and soul into his physical etheric body and then experiences the illness as he describes it in his somnambulistic condition. He experiences a strong catabolic process going on in his physical etheric body, a kind of reverse process of nature. But now, suppose he is outside his body, with his astral body and ego. Then he has experiences of the spiritual aspect of outer nature. Suppose he experiences a sick organ within himself, plate six, middle. Sick because it allows some outer process to occur in an unhealthy way. This is experienced in the somnambulistic state, and the inner process is described. If the person is in the opposite condition, the somnambulism works into his ego and astral body when these are farther out of his physical and etheric body. If the spiritual elemental life of nature comes into his dreams, then he experiences what is spiritual in the minerals. He experiences the corresponding spirit of the minerals. And what does he dream about? He dreams of his medicinal remedy. You see, here you have the connection between many aspects of somnambulistic life. The somnambulist alternates between two conditions, as I have described. In one condition he dreams of his illness. In the other condition he dreams of the remedy. And generally speaking, that is the way pathology and therapy were explored in the old mysteries. In those olden times there was not so much experimenting as there is today. The sick person was brought into the temple and put into a kind of somnambulistic condition by temple priests who were properly trained. This condition was increased to the level at which the sick person could describe the process of his illness. Then the opposite somnambulistic condition was brought about, and the temple priest was told the dream that contained the therapy. This was the manner of inquiry in the oldest mysteries. It led from disease to cure. And so it was that medical science was cultivated in olden times by seeking knowledge of man through the human being himself. We don't have to go back to those old methods. We have to move forward to methods by which we are able through imaginative experience to follow the course of an illness and by which we are able to experience the healing process through intuitive activity that leads not into the human being, but out from him. What has formerly been a kind of experimentation in this field will now have to become careful observation. You see the direction in which we are turning. External physical science was in olden times a purely observing science. Then it began to experiment, and more and more substituted experiment for pure observation. That was right. But medical science did the same thing in imitation, and that was not right. It experimented on man with the temple research. We must find the way to change over from experimenting to observing, to an observation of life that is sustained by spiritual knowledge and enriched by scientific research. For whoever really looks at life can catch a, few, a view of illness everywhere. In the simplest form of everyday life that has deviated only to the slightest degree from so-called normal, something can be seen that will lead, if considered properly, 
to a recognition of complicated disease processes. One has only to understand how things relate to one another. But this shows us that the physician must more and more become a really practical individual, again the exact opposite of what recent materialistic development has made him. He has gradually become a pure scientist, and that makes no sense. There is only sense in someone being a physician if he is always able to cope with natural laws in a living way, not if he knows them abstractly. With abstract knowledge of them, one has not yet even begun to work with them. That's the situation from one side. Let us look at the other side, the side that the priest must see. We think of the priest's mission as guiding human beings in their approach to the spiritual world, in everything that will help their ego and astral body to find their way in the spiritual world. If it is the physician's task to inquire into the nature of man from a spiritual point of view, to explore pathological conditions from a spiritual point of view, then what must the priest look for? The priest has to find what can lead a human being toward the spiritual world. His attitude toward the spiritual world, whether he loves the spiritual world, how much he is permeated by the spiritual world, insofar as these things are apparent in normal life. The priest must deal with all the normal or abnormal symptoms that the human soul manifests in this regard in everyday life. For the priest we have to point out the opposite course to that of the physician. We told the physician that if the somnambulist is allowed to describe his sick organ, he will also describe the medicinal remedy for it from out of his dreams. Let us look again at the priest in the ancient mysteries. Actually, he was not primarily interested in discovering medicinal remedies, although, of course, he was intensely interested in healing, for he was first and foremost a friend of man. But he did not stop at healing. He was interested in more than that. He was interested in the following. He saw that the somnambulist found the remedy in his dreams while he was in the spiritual world with his ego and astral body. He paid particular attention to this soul while it was in the spiritual world, and he followed it back again into the body. And what did he find? Of course, he found himself again confronting the sick organ. But now, from what he had perceived of that soul while it was out of the body, he knew how the astral body and ego would work in this organ if it were healthy. Upon returning again to the sick organ, he knew what the situation would be under healthy conditions. Now he realized how the astral body and ego, out of their divine spiritual powers, take hold normally in the human organism, how they sit normally within it. He learned to know them in their healthy normality through the dreams in the spiritual world. He learned how they relate to the physical world when they descend into the physical body. He learned to know the inner relation of man to the spiritual world. This knowledge should influence the priest as he enacts the sacrament in which he is carrying back the spiritual world. For the spiritual world is present in the sacrament through the establishment of the ritual. The ritual unites spirit with physical substance by virtue of deep insight into the relation of spirit to matter. Inspirited physical substance is led back into man, and the relation is established in him that unites his astral body and ego within his physical and etheric bodies with the divine spiritual being of the world. Everything in this relation depends upon the sacraments being celebrated with such an attitude on the part of the priest. Everything depends upon our permeating ourselves with such thoughts. For instance, 
the relation between experience in the body and experience out of the body. Secrets of pathology from observing the body when it is left. Secrets of therapy from observing abnormal life in the spiritual world as compared to normal perception in the spiritual world. What was established in ancient times in secret temple procedures by prominent somnambulists must now be again established by a human being developing spiritual perception in himself and observing the connections. In this area, experiment must give way to observation. Now, it is important that the physicians and priests in the anthroposophical movement are already united in their knowledge of the, such facts as these. That is what really binds us together. We are permeated by a different kind of knowledge from what others have. By contrast, the idea that some sort of union or association or group should be formed is just an abstraction. What really binds us together is the possession of a certain knowledge. Those who possess this knowledge do obviously belong together and should feel closely united to one another. Any external association should be an expression of the inner union created by this knowledge. Our time suffers very much in this respect. For instance, often when I speak today to, say, a youth gathering, even though I fully appreciate their endeavor, and even though I myself have the very best intentions, it is extraordinarily difficult to experience their response to the concrete truths that should be filling their souls, to hear them say, quote, the first thing we must do is to join together, close quote. Well, indeed, everything in these last decades, decades has been, quote, unquote, joined together ad infinitum. People have gone on and on joining together, but they've never yet got anything real for a result by tacking zeros onto one another indefinitely, zero, 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 about eight times, and so on. One empty consciousness, to begin with, joined to another empty consciousness, joined to a third consciousness, again empty, that all adds up to nothing. By contrast, you only have to assume a content, a content that is, after all, the basis of all zeros. Excuse me, a content that is, after all, the basis of all zeros. One, and there's an, the numeral one in parentheses. Then you have something. It doesn't have to be a human being, but it has to be some genuine content. And interestingly enough, this assumes that there is something there to begin with. It doesn't even have to be a human being. It can be real, living knowledge. These are things we should think about in our time, where usually people are much too comfortable to search for the concrete. They are content simply to put abstractions together. Joining together is all right, of course, but it will come of itself if something concrete is there first. Perhaps this is something that should be understood first, before anything else by those who work among modern mankind as physicians and priests. For one can certainly say, two conditions can be observed today throughout the world. Generally speaking, a human being's ego and astral body do not find his physical and etheric bodies properly, whatever may be the waking condition. Also, truly, for someone observing the world as it evolves, materialistic views don't really worry him unduly. Let the monists and any of the others combat one another. Nothing is accomplished thereby. But that is certainly not the fundamental evil in the evolution of humanity. If one is observing the evolutionary process, one is not particularly interested to participate in these discussions of world views. For actually, whether one thinks this or another thinks that, opinions are frightfully thin little things in the human soul. They don't have much impact on reality. They're just bubbles in the reality of this world. If one bubble hits another, if one bursts, if another becomes a bit thicker from the bursting, none of it matters. What 
does matter, what should be clearly realized, is that no one ever becomes a materialist if he is sitting with his ego and astral body properly in his physical and etheric bodies. In other words, to be a materialist means in a finer sense to be ill. One must fill one's whole being with this knowledge. To be a materialist means to be ill. And it is not surprising in the least that when the other people, those who are sitting properly inside their physical and etheric bodies, encounter the sick materialists, they turn away to exactly the opposite pole, all the vague mist of spiritualism. Here we come to a difficult realm, because the things do not take place in those parts of the world that still have a connection with one another. They happen where the world has already been thrown into chaos and its pieces lie scattered about. One thing no longer reveals itself as a healing remedy for another, for they are falling away from each other. So long as the sick person speaks of what is going on in his organs, his dreams will still reveal the corresponding healing remedies in the outer world. But in our present time, a person who is ill from materialism will not be describing sick inner organs. He has broken free of his organism. He wants to describe the external world as would naturally happen to a materialist. Then he finds not remedial dreams, but the opposite, false spiritualism, certainly not a healing remedy, quite the contrary, something that brings on the illness more strongly than ever. And so we find today in our time, if I may draw an analogy between medical work for individual human beings and what I would call cultural pathology and therapy, the analogy is surely justified, we find that spiritualism, for instance, does not by any means offer a remedy for materialism, but corresponds to the somnambulist's dream revealing his sick organs. Now sometimes a person that properly should have taken hold of a person's... Let me read that again. Now sometimes a process that properly should have taken hold of a person's inner organism pushes through the organism to the periphery, to the outer world. There is then the pathological condition called, quote-unquote, rash. This corresponds exactly to what I've been telling you. One sees with one's own eyes that what has been inside and is now outside is nothing healthy. It is an aberration. The physician should see clearly that materialism is the rash of an illness and needs to be regarded as a medical problem. This will build a bridge to the priest's observation on the other side. The priest sees the symptoms that rise out of sick human souls, out of their need, out of their feelings. Spiritualism is just such a symptom. One comes to realize that in the widest sense, sick life wants to sink down into the world, that all the disease in the present world outlook does indeed work itself out fully, insofar as it rests on the will, by working into man and sickening his inner life. In the present epoch of human evolution, it is not going to be possible to see something that could be seen clearly in former times due to different human characteristics in those days. Namely, how a false direction of the will, a false world outlook, a false view of life, all of which were designated in olden times as sin, how these things cause illness in the organism. For they do not do so immediately in the ordinary way. We are only aware of the connection in the rarest cases, cases that are an intermediate stage between the sin and what can obviously be diagnosed as the resulting illness. These intermediate stages may simply develop into morbid conditions. But in this modern epoch of evolution, the sin and the real illness are so detached from each other that now they even occur in separate incarnations. In earlier epochs, they were able to appear in close connection as cause and effect, but as humanity developed, 
they became separated so that sin appeared in one incarnation, illness in a subsequent one. Here then begins the domain of the priest. The priest may no longer merely continue traditions of olden times, speaking of sin as the cause of illness. But if he now has knowledge of repeated earth lives, he can speak of sin from that point of view. Then he will again be speaking from the standpoint of truth. Much that priests and the world today say about these things is no longer true. It no longer corresponds to fact. These teachings originated in olden times, and today no one is interested in changing the teachings to accord with what is demanded in our time. We have to relate ourselves to all this. Then it will be possible to make our study of pastoral medicine fruitful in both directions. My intention is to give two more lectures for this course, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. I am planning this now so that you can make your plans accordingly. The end of Lecture 9